All right, I'm here with Paul Thompson, uh, original skinhead. Uh, Paul, when did you first discover um, the skinhead subculture? Um, well, it kind of discovered me um, uh, because um, I was there, in fact, uh, wearing the clothes, something like them, before... Um, the uh, skinhead sub subculture was was devised, if if you like. Um, if you can imagine, 1969 is usually the year that uh, that people uh, associate with the with the term skinhead. Um, it's when it came to um, the notice of the media. It, it's when kids started calling themselves uh, skinheads. Um, and at that time, I was 18 going 19. And before then, I'd, uh, for most of my teenage years, I was a, a kind of a wannabe mod. Um, and um, uh, I was living in Blackpool in the northwest of England. And, and by the time I was 16 going 17, I was going around with the mod crowd there. And in early 1968, I moved down to London and hung out with the kids. They call themselves mods? Yeah, they yeah. did. Um, uh, certainly up in the Northwest, uh, and, and people went on calling themselves mods right into the Northern Soul e era, some kids anyway. And I moved down to London, and I started um, going around with, uh, with, with young people who wore roughly the same clothes as I did, and I went to the clubs. I, I, you know, I um, listened to the same music, started buying the clothes, and then all, all of a sudden I found that... Um, uh, this term skinhead, which had been a kind of a, um, an insult um, that the greasers, that the, the bikers used to use uh, of us, was becoming something that, uh, that we were beginning to call ourselves. And so it was about 1969 that um, the term skinhead caught up with me because I, I was already there, already on the scene. Um, and that was the time when uh, when new youngsters uh, started coming in, and uh, the crowd was getting considerably younger than myself. But uh, but there we go. What do you think is the difference between? Let me let me think about this question. Um, what do you think attracted kids? Okay, I got it. What's the difference between what attracted kids to the scene back then versus any other revival era? Oh, um, I, I think it was uh, it was perceived. Well, it, kids always perceive the uh, the group they're getting into as something new, uh, even if it is a quote revival. Um, it's something they take over. It's something they make their own. Um, and I guess back in 1969, it was uh, it was seen as um, an alternative to uh, um, to some of the other lifestyle choices that uh, kids had before them. It was very very much our own thing. It wasn't dictated by uh, um, by the pop music industry or by the fashion industry, uh, although it was heavily dependent on music and clothes and what have you it was things that we picked ourselves more than anything else right so it was just a question yeah yeah i mean um you're basically uh let me let me go over that um you're saying that the style was a little more original mm -hmm. and uh you, it was still sort of being formulated, if you will. Um, kind of. I mean, the, the style was basically there. The, the Levi's were there. Um, the, uh, the tennis shirts were there. Um, the short hair was there. Uh, the brogue shoes were there. The boots were there. The braces were there. It, it was, you know, these pieces were, were, were all around in the, uh, in the fashion scene, particularly, uh, particularly working class, not exclusively working class, but particularly working class urban youngsters in, in that era. Um, the only differences I noticed really was that by 1969, um, we were getting back into button down shirts, which had been around in the mod era uh, and had 
gradually died down, but we've been picked up again. Same with uh, with the Harrington style jacket. Um, odd other things turned up, especially in the uh, in the skinhead era that the Levi Stay pressed, Prince of Wales check jackets, things like that. But um, it wasn't a sudden rupture with what had gone uh, previously. It was just. Uh, we picked up on uh, on different aspects of a, of the same style or a similar style. I mean, I, my first Prince of Wales suit, uh, I was actually given that by uh, a guy who'd been on the mod scene, uh, just in time for it for, for Prince of Wales check to come back in the skinhead scene. Um, ditto, I think my first um, uh, mohair suit. Um, uh, I, <laughs> being being one of the um, uh, one of the kids who'd stayed in education, I I, I didn't have um, an income, um, and so I, I I was very much reliant on uh, on picking up bits of uh, of the look here and there. Um, I got away with it, but but there you go. Was that uh so was that not common uh for many uh people in your uh your class or your demographic to to stay in the education system uh, it was I, I guess the um uh the the bulk of uh, of um the late mods and early skinheads were working class kids um and uh generally what happened uh if you were working class you left school around 16 and got a job. So you had disposable income. Um, you know, the, the same might not be true. I mean, I was, I guess, lower middle class. Um, and there were quite a number of, uh, of youngsters like me in the suburbs, uh, who's, you know, went in the same, um, for the same sartorial style and the same music and frequented the same clubs. Um, you know, it, it was more common for the likes of us to go on to higher education. There were some, you know, I, I knew quite a lot of working class kids that made it into college as well. Um, it's not exclusively um, middle class thing to get to college. Uh, but a lot of college kids, of course, would be um, trendies and hippies and people with long hair and, uh, and what have you. Um, I can remember at the, the college I was at um, very briefly because my, my college career back then um failed miserably but uh there were there were half a dozen uh youngsters uh same style as me at uh, the college i was at when you say failed uh did you you not graduate <laughs> i i most certainly did not graduate um i i i i wasn't really succeeding in in college and i got badly ill and the dean of studies said take a gap year so I took a gap year, got well, and just went and got a job rather than go back to uh, to university. So you never completed that. Uh, no. No. Okay. I, had to, I had to wait till I was um, uh, retired from uh, full employment. I, I, I've had I'm having my university career now. So oh, interesting. Yeah. So, but you know what? It's interesting. Uh, what what I'm getting from you is that it was uh, an option, though, for working class kids to to become educated. And is that so, or did you need money? Was it not socialized? Or uh, back in those days, um, it was possible, still possible, to get university grants and college grants. Um, that that was. That idea was phased out in, uh, I think, the 1980s, uh, along uh, when Margaret Thatcher was prime minister. Uh, the whole idea became then um, you got a um, student loan, which uh, uh, then hung, hung around your neck like a millstone uh, through your working life until you paid it back. It's not, not too dissimilar to what's going on here. I imagine so. I imagine so. Very much... Uh, uh, Margaret Thatcher's ideas were very much along the uh, the lines of Reaganomics, you know, the 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 the, the American model. Uh, but uh, before then, it was possible to get a student grant. So you're like still really into the clothes and the music. Um, what? Well, you could say that. I mean, the thing is, 
Um, I find a lot of the clothes of that era um, suit uh, somebody of, of, of my age. Uh, I mean, there's, you know, th there's nothing strange about um, somebody of my age wearing uh, a tennis shirt, wearing a, a Fred Perry. Right. Um, in, in, in fact, um, I, 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 along with studying, I have a voluntary job at the uh, University of St. Andrews. And at the moment, we have a lot of paying guests who are there for uh, the, the, the Open Golf Tournament, the 150th Open Golf Tournament. And the number of elderly people wearing tennis shirts is, is, is absolutely phenomenal. Um, I do happen to think that the, um, the smarts, uh, smart and casual side of the late, mod, early skinhead um, clothes continue to look good on people uh, down certain hours, you know, when the, when you get a bit uh, longer in the tooth, uh, it certainly beat, beats going around in um, in beige. Yeah, and it's it's kind of it's timeless clothing. Yeah. Um, I guess the only difference is you might wear your trousers a little longer, you know, something like I that. Know. No, really, okay. No, no, no. I I refuse to have trousers that uh, that bag on the shoes. Um, I, I I like my I like my jeans and my uh, trousers and what have you to hang properly. And if they're bagging down on the shoes, they don't hang properly. Gotcha. So um, take us back in time again and tell. Is there some like crazy stories? Because like I, I I just know from you know, all the skinheads of sort of later eras, it was always like they talked about, you know, it was, it was violence. It was, um, girls. It might've been like some gang thing. Um, but it seems like what I get from a lot, of, like from what I hear from some original skinheads, not that there's, uh, many left to hear from, um, that it was a little more innocent, in the 60s and um we, we, but w what's your take on that um well oh interesting stories from the 60s more innocent I, it's it's difficult to say i mean um, unless you were like uh you know like a, a football hooligan or something like you know like martin king or mm -hmm. uh eccles or any of those did you know any of those guys or um, I, I knew quite a few. Well, I, you know, I used to go to football matches, and I, I knew quite a lot of, uh, of guys. And, and um, I saw a lot of uh, a, a lot of the violence that went on. Uh, I can remember um, standing with a crowd of uh, uh, of older kids, you know, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, um, when there was a uh, a surge of people uh, on, on the terraces. Uh, at a football match um and um you know it, it went th it went one way and it went the other guys fighting each other and we just stood there and we had the uh the scarves on so we were identifiable and because we stood there the people who were fighting just flowed around us they said, oh, well, these guys are standing there we're not going to take them on interesting <laughs> it is i i spent a lot of time avoiding violence um uh, as much as i could i used to i used to talk it down and it helped the fact that i uh, i looked pretty mean um i was fairly tall five ten and a half um i was skinny i had long sideburns mournful expression i looked as if i could take care of myself uh, and that meant that uh, i got a reputation um uh, amongst some people for, for for being a hard nut when i didn't when i wasn't mm -hmm. i can i can remember if if you're looking for 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 interesting stories i i can remember um a bunch of us used to hang out at the bowling alley in lewisham in uh, in southeast london i don't even know if it's still there um and um my my mates were there and there was a guy uh, talking to them and they said, oh, we're waiting for Paul Thompson to come in. I said, oh, blimey, he's after me, this guy said. I'm, I'm, I'm going to leg it. So he went out the back, went out the back door. And I got there. And as soon as I walked in, 
all my friends were killing themselves laughing. They, they were just laughing their heads off when I walked in. I said, what, what's, what's up? Because they knew what a pussycat I was. They, they, they knew that I would avoid fighting if I could. I wouldn't back down, but I would, have, I, I would you know, try and talk it away. Uh, I wouldn't have run, but I, but I would have uh, uh, tried to talk it away. And they told me this guy had legged it out the back. And I had to laugh too because um okay i did have a beef with him this is this is it, it was it was a difference of opinion over a young woman let's put it that way As um a, so i I, right. I was i certainly was rather cross with him but i don't think i even so i would have uh, taken it to um to fisticuffs um but uh, it you know it, it it just shows i mean th again i can remember uh, being at a youth club in Bromley, uh, that's kind of the uh, the North Kent fringes of London. And a couple of guys, um, they uh, took a dislike to me. Um, and they, they walked past me in the corridor and trod, trod on my feet and called me a rude word. I thought, this, this is not nice. And somebody told me they'd been in the back uh, breaking bottles to put broken glass in between their... Uh, uh, their fingers. I thought, what am I going to do? So I walked down the corridor into the body of the youth club, pretended I hadn't seen them, and I stood in front of them. And I stood there for about 10 minutes, you know, just checking out what was going in the room. Um, and when I reckon I'd, I'd stood there long enough to uh, prove that my, my nonchalance, if you can say, um, I just strolled over to the... Uh, uh, the, the place where they were selling uh, coke had a brief word with a, the, the, a brief friendly word with a person who was serving had a had a can of coke then strolled nonchalantly to the to the door and strolled out of the youth club got round the corner and ran like hell <laughs> um, but I, I thought to myself I've got out of the dangerous situation but I've proved myself to be a hard nut in front of the guys who were after me. And uh, about a year later, um, I, uh, I I bumped into uh, into one of those guys in um, uh, the Savoy Rooms in Catford, which was uh, the, the place we used to go every uh, Sunday evening to hear the reggae sounds. And uh, am I okay, by the way? Am I okay using uh, bad language? Because yeah, yeah. It, okay. And um, uh, apparently, he spotted me. And he said to his mate, I know that cunt from somewhere. And he came, came over and he said, uh, excuse me, mate, where do I know you from? And I said, uh, from the youth club a year ago, we almost had a fight. Oh, yeah, I remember. How are you doing? All right, how are you doing? All right, well, see ya. Yeah, see ya. And off he walked. And that was it. Uh, I, I thought, you know, there's a story. There's a story to tell the grandkids. But... Uh, yeah, no, it's interesting. Um, it doesn't see like it seems like there wasn't as much uh, like policing or like, you know, gatekeeping of, of mm. a label or anything back then. Well, different people and have a different sto a story to tell you um, that there's, uh, there's there's a guy I know who, uh, who who can tell you lots and lots of horror stories about uh, about violence. It came from a different area. Um, came from an area that was very, very territorial. Uh, the thing about where I used to hang, out, hang around is there wasn't an identifiable crew. People used to filter in from all over the place. So there wasn't that much, um, it wasn't the same sort of turf um, identity. Um, so th there was less, um, uh, th there was less trouble that was to do with where you were from. Gotcha. Yeah, it, um, maybe it's like that now, but uh, it seems like nowadays, or at least when I was like um, getting into it, you know, um, like 15, 20 years ago, you know, there was a lot of, uh, you know, you really had to prove yourself kind of thing or else, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of people wouldn't wouldn't let you hang out with them, you know, Um well, it's it just lucky I, I never had to prove myself because yeah. um, I I didn't back down. 
I, I think I've only ever backed away from a fight once. But I used to stand my ground and I used to talk to people. And because I used to talk to people, they think, well, he, you know, he must be able to take care of himself or he'd have, you know, he'd have, have apologized and backed off. But I would never do that. Um, a guy who picked a, picked a fight with me in a pub, again, an issue over a young woman. Uh, and I just, I just wasn't having that. And I just stood there with my, my, my uh, hands in my pockets and let him rant. Um, and his mates came over and I thought, oh, God, I'm in trouble now. But they came over and, and, and pulled him away and, and started apologising to me. Yeah, don't worry, he's, he's, he's drunk, he's had a few. I thought, ah, oh, no, no problem. Um, and that was because they took one look at me and thought, hard oh, nut, no, not backing down. Um, and they thought their mate was in trouble. And I'm, I'm sure, like, the, the look, the, you know, your attire and everything – like uh made made it seem more so i know like when i got into it um you know when i was a teenager i i i felt like bigger than i was and i was always a really small kid you know mm -hmm. but it felt bigger if i wore that outfit you know these, these guys were were in the same were wearing the same gear as me yeah yeah they they understood the ethos uh, like I said, the only time I backed down from a fight was when I, I, I snapped at a mate of mine over something. And he stood up and he said, you talking to me? And I thought to myself, um, he can beat them. He can beat nine bells out of me. And he's a mate. I don't want to fight him. So I just apologized. And he said, all right, and sat down. But then, well, you know, wh why the hell should I fight a mate? I like your philosophy. Um, I don't. I like I no longer uh, condone um, unnecessary violence, and I, mm -hmm. I I think it is important to just talk things out. Um, uh, I find like a lot of the the violence that people engage in today, and and you know in the skinhead scene, it's it's really just uh, I, I I just think it, it's causing like a lot more damage, you know, and instead well, we should embracing each other you know and i've i've like i've said this in past interviews i've done things that i feel really regretful of just because i was trying to like um prove myself you know because i was insecure or whatever and um you know i i don't i don't think that violence is the answer i'm not going to pretend it didn't happen it happened a lot yeah it happened a lot it, it just you know i managed to avoid a heck of a lot of it uh, i wouldn't like to play it down but the whole thing about um, uh, the original Skinners is, is that we kind of grew organically and nobody was telling you to sign your name in blood. Um, uh, you know, you've, you've got to take part in football violence. You've got to uh, be a racist. You've got to be this. You've got to be that. You've got to be the other. Um, a lot of that happened because of the environment in which uh, the, uh, the Skinner scene happened. But it, it was never obligatory, if you know what I mean. It seemed to me that, that um, uh, some following um, revival groups seized on that. Um, you know, the, the, the people that you see wearing um, uh, army fatigues and, and um, uh, zip-up uh, jackets, um, and uh, uh, taking part in uh, in racist parades with swastika flags and what have you, they've gone into um, an aspect of uh, of skinhead, and they've made that uh, the be all and end all. And they've gone in with that intention, with those views, um, and created a different sort of skinhead. In a way. Uh you know, I, I don't approve of the politics, um, but that's their choice. What do you think, like, because there were uh, black skinheads back mm -hmm. then, correct? Yeah. Why, um, why do you think that skinhead became so much more well-known as a right-wing subculture or a racist subculture than 
like why didn't it why didn't it go the other way where it became more about like uh celebrating black culture because um, it, music obviously is, it's jamaican music yeah. right and yeah. uh and a lot of the style i mean even though it's like I, ivy league style like it's still like the way that it was worn was bitten off of from like what the black kids were wearing correct me if i'm wrong but i mean that's that's yeah. the story that's told right there, there was a lot of influence um from the uh the, the west indians in, in in britain um particularly particularly length of the trousers i, I would say uh, and the uh the, the liking sharp suits um why do i think it developed that way i honestly think that um we were it, it's very very difficult to generalize but if you take uh revival skinhead for, uh, if you take a snapshot in say the late 70s around 1980 um you're in a situation where the um reggae music has had a decade of diverting into um uh rastafarian um uh philosophy um some of the music really terrific and uh the west indian youth are um you know gravitating towards wearing dreadlocks and speaking iaric and what have you and the meantime a lot of white kids are have gone away from uh soul and town motown and via the punk era got into oi you have less potential for black and white kids to mix um, and that's, I, I think, one possible factor behind uh, the uh, the, revi the revivalist of 10 years further on. I can't speak for uh, um, any, 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 any uh, later than that. I mean, 10 years further on, I was um, moonlighting as a club DJ in, uh, um, you know, punk and new wave clubs in Liverpool. Um, and... Uh, uh, I saw um, some punks starting picking up on um, on, on former um, skinhead fashion, uh, just as as part of the um, the looking urban um, ethos of, of punk, if you like. Um, and as I say, I, I think the fact that uh, there was no longer this stylistic and musical. Um, meeting place between uh, black and white youth might have contributed to uh, uh, to the estrangement of the of some of the revival groups that's a um that's a pretty good way to explain it i think um although so there was what was that that show uh that cop show from the late 60s early 70s um english they had a couple episodes about skinheads. Uh, I think that would be Softly Softly. Yeah. So what else did they call it? It was another name for it, too. Um, huh. um, something. Um, well, the, the, the show that I remember uh, was called Softly Softly. It grew out of a 1960s show called Zed Cars, okay. uh, which had been set near Liverpool. Softly Softly, they'd moved. Uh, they moved some of the characters somewhere else, um, and they had um, they had one episode task, where task force, yeah, task yeah. force, right? Yeah, that was that was if you like softly, softly task force. It was yeah, uh, continuation. They had one show where they were expecting an influx of uh, skinheads into a particular seaside area, and that didn't happen. And the next show was um, uh, it featured a. a, a, a a, a gang of um, a, a small gang of um, skinheads, and, and um, but in particular, uh, somebody was supposed to be the leader of the gang and his girlfriend. Um, and I think they had a handful of people who were actual skinheads playing extras. Uh, but this guy, the guy and the girl, I, I found they were they were cardboard cutouts. Um, and I'd seen it all before. I'd seen um, Teddy Boys on TV, Mods and Rockers on TV, and 
if you like, the script writers for shows like this had 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 one idea of what teenage troublemakers looked like and sounded like, and they just changed the clothes around. And this guy's clothes weren't even terribly close. Um, it, it was uh, interesting. Uh, I, I I actually like quite liked. Um, well, like a lot of them were look. A lot of the extras, I guess, looked you know the part, and he he looked more militant. He had like the bleached. The leader had like the bleach jacket and the super skin tight jeans. And um, mm -hmm. and I, I was like, I was kind of surprised because I think that episode came out in 69 or 70. And I was like, oh, like, that's like a little more almost um, oy looking, uh, you know, for that. Yeah, in a, in a way. Yeah, the, 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 whole double, the whole double denim look he had. And then yeah. there was another... There was another show a few decades later, Inspector George Gently, which was uh, set in the fifth in the sixties, and they had a skinhead episode of that um, set in Newcastle, um, and uh, that was so full of inaccuracies that um, you know it was it was beyond ludicrous. But well, they, you know, the same show got North and Soul wrong. But so what can you expect? This, I'm I'm finding this. Um, to a lot of script writers, obviously people who, who, who never even lived through the era, um, it's it, it's like with any historical drama. There's bound to be inaccuracies because people uh, weren't there. They don't they, they they don't know the sights, the sound, the smells, the ephemera, the things that come and go, and so they get it wrong. Um, There's you know, like I, a nuance. Um, yeah. To, to it yeah um what else are we getting wrong in in, in our studies of history i mean I, I you know i'm i'm currently that, well, that's exactly like that's one of the reasons mm -hmm. i'm doing this series um part of it is to just like like the title says to deconstruct it because i find it interesting to like if you say what is a skinhead what is a punk mm -hmm. what is you know any of these labels and yeah. You really it depends who you ask. What? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I and if you really were to like try and deconstruct it, it you can't you can't like really put your finger on on it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It the it if you try and trait equalize as they yeah. would say in you know philosophical debate, it doesn't like it doesn't hold up without creating some kind of contradiction without everybody being able to be that thing or. But anyway. Um, but yeah, you know, but what I found skinhead was one of my first introductions to how things are not what they seem and how the media <laughs> lies, you know, um, and, and how they could like within just a couple decades, like they can completely change mm. the, the meaning of a word or, or how it's perceived Indeed, uh, right. I mean, I'll, I'll make two, I'll make two points. Uh, a lot of uh, the image of skinhead was created by uh, yeah. by the media, um, and the other point I, I wanted to make, just from something you were saying uh, a couple of minutes back, is there will be people watching this who were there at the time who'll think I'm talking a lot of rubbish, because um, different people had different experiences in different places, uh, and and somebody who was 15 or 16 in the same place that I was would have a different experience. Um, and, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm prepared for people to be very, uh, to be very surprised by some of the things that I say, but this is my experience <clears throat> and it might not chime with everybody else's. Yeah. Um, and that's, well, that's kind of why I brought up the, uh, the task force episode because I'll, I thought that your, your, uh, explanation of of like the split between you know um how black and white kids would mm. uh engage with the subculture was pretty good but like then with an episode with that like that tv show is just like one example i guess and then there's of course the richard allen novels mm. where they do um well at least in the tv show they have there's that whole dialogue between the cop and uh the the gang leader where 
the gang leader says, oh, yeah, we 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 like black kids. Of course, they they used um, a very uh, derogatory racial slur. I think he uh, called them spades or something. And well, uh, that didn't used to be derogatory at one time. OK, yeah. I mean, I know. Well, like, he, he, even uh, I've I. I've known in the 1960s black kids use the, that word of them of themselves. Right. I mean, and that could similarly be how uh, a lot of that culture uses the N word now. Um, although, you know, I don't, I don't condone any of it, but um, it, so what, but what, what happened of course in the episode is he say, but, but we don't like, we don't like Pakistanis. Right. And they were, so I guess you could say they were prejudiced or they were in a way racist or mm -hmm. xenophobic maybe is the proper terminology, but they were still painting these kids to be like, you know, ignorant and, um, you know, just, yeah, sort of big bigots. Right. Um, so there, there was even at that time, whether it was 69 or 70, they were saying they were trying to say and I, I know like probably most of probably most white people in the world probably held that sort of view, regardless of what subculture they were part of. You know, not I'm not trying to blank generalize everyone, but it was just a more prevalent mindset back then. Right. Yeah. But they were so. the, the media seemed to be saying, oh, no, it's these kids, this subculture in particular is where a lot of that is concentrated but mm -hmm. you know uh i you know talk to people like you or i've i've talked to other original skinheads as well and you're like well come on and, and of course there's lots of documentaries of where they talk to people like that and they're like oh, that's not it's not the way it was you know mm -hmm. but of course you got the 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 bbc man alive um documentary where he's interviewing the skinheads and they're yes they say yeah. this they say the same thing and i'm wondering okay did they um did they like really select these kids the, those particular kids because they knew they could get them to say something like that whereas other kids probably wouldn't well it's, that, yeah it's not easy to say i mean um i saw that when it went out live, I, I, just the same as I saw the uh, the Softly Softly Task Force um, episode when it went out live, um, and both of these things stuck in my uh, in in my mind. Um, I almost thought, I mean, that, that's tawny. I thought people are going <laughs> people are going to think that this is what you have to sign up for, um, and it, it's not necessarily so. I mean, they had those kids in that documentary. They had them sitting on the ground with uh, the, their, uh, their knees bent so that their jeans would ride up and show their boots. Right, right, right. Apart from anything else, they've got the, these kids lounging on the ground, you know, tough teenagers. Yeah. Um, they were just ordinary kids. Um, and the interviewers kind of put them on the spot, asked them leading questions. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they there was a lot of general um, prejudice in those days against uh, immigrants, particularly from South Asia. Um, when Idi Amin expelled uh, all the South Asians from Uganda and they came um, en masse to, uh, to Britain, there was resentment about that. And it wasn't just uh, amongst um, uh, youngsters with short hair, it was, it was, it was general. Um, and what you'd expect a bunch of working class kids not to have the, the, the general views that their parents and the rest of the people in their environment environment had, um, you know, that would be unrealistic. This bunch of kids had the views of people who came from where they came. Right. And what about, what about you? What, uh, like, what were, did, did your views were your views similar and then they shifted or do you, how, how were you thinking at that time? Um, I, I found, I've always found racism to be a waste of time. Uh, if, if I had anything against South Asians at that time, it was purely that their young men dressed 
um, in a way that I found, pardon the expression, poncy. Uh, young South Asian, uh, South Asian men in those days seemed to be wearing uh, little shorty leather jackets and, and, and tight slacks that were uh, tan in color and, and wearing elfin shoes. And um, I hated that fashion. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't hate the blokes who were wearing it. I just hated the fashion. So why 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 pick on uh, the why did like that kind why did um, a lot of English people pick on Asians rather than than Jamaicans? I mean, maybe they did, but like why why was it with the young working class kids? Mm -hmm. Why did they? Yeah, wh what was it about uh, Asian immigrants that they didn't feel the same way about Jamaican immigrants? Now, I, I'm not a sociologist. Yeah. Uh, and I wasn't studying the situation back then. I can only I can only say what 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 I saw. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, the uh, the youngsters that we're talking about grew up post Windrush and they grew up with uh, a lot of black teenagers um, around them. And these black well, teenagers, there, right? That's what you again? they were already there. Yeah, uh, and uh, a lot of these, a lot of the black guys that I knew in Southeast London um, just had London accents. In fact, they could code switch between um, uh, uh, London yeah, and yeah. Uh, and a lot, a lot of them did. Um, and um, you know, for our part, we 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 knew what words like rasclat meant. Uh, through having uh, through having black mates, and I think the um, uh, a, a lot of South Asian people arrived since then, um, and although the second generation of Southeast Asian um, uh, people in Britain began to be. Uh, to become more more British in, in in outlook and the sound of their voice and what have you, it, it hadn't happened so much um, at the time we're talking about. And it's it's always the way when you get uh, in flight, when you get immigrants into um, uh, any country, in particular into the big cities, that they will begin to ghettoize. Um, and that is that is always a problem, and it it, it always. Um, uh, results in, in, in tension. But as I say, I'm not a sociologist. This is just a lay person talking about uh, a, a, about what I what I understand from a, a very badly educated view in in in, in the uh, in the in the subject. Did you ever meet any um, like uh, South Asian kids that? adopted the uh skinhead look at that time I never saw any never saw it um so i would say for someone uh who was part of that original era of the skinhead movement do you okay well i get okay let me sorry take a second i'm gonna think about my question here um are there other people your age that you know that are still involved as involved as you are because i feel like um every once in a blue moon i might meet some someone your age who said oh yeah i was you know a mod or or whatever um or i was into it you know or i i hung out with skinheads but they they obviously it, it's not part of their life anymore that you know, they, they wear norm, they dress normally, normally, I mean, whatever that means, but they're not like focusing on, on wearing a Fred Perry tennis, mm -hmm. shirt. you know, they're not focusing on wearing, um, mate, I put this on for you. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've, I've, got, I've got a bunch of them in my wardrobe upstairs. I thought I'll put one of these on for Nick. So there you go. Ah, uh, thanks, Paul. No, I, I, well, yeah, but like, still, you're, you're. I mean, you're writing a book, right? Yeah. I'm editing a book. I, I'm afraid it's been, it's been held up. Um, it was supposed to be out in 2019. All sorts of reasons have, uh, have held it up. 
Um, I've I've lost the publisher for various reasons, and I'm, I'm going to have to try and um, and, and self publish it. Um, but yeah, well, I, guess, I guess my point was is that you're still so. I mean, uh, I met you through the the you know mods to Suedehead group on Styleform. You're still involved to a certain extent. Yeah. What What is it? Do you think that is that keeps someone like you involved? Whereas like a lot of these. A lot of other people your age would probably just, you know, not give it the uh, the time of day. Well, I, th I think that that forum um, was very um, very important for me because it it it, uh, it became a place where I could um, talk about my experiences from uh, when I, when I was in my late teens. Um, and to a certain extent, put uh, put a lot of the records straight. It's where it's where people would listen instead of going by the softly, softly task force um, image. Um, and uh, this wasn't intentional in my in my part. But uh, so, as I said before, such a lot of the uh, other clothes are, are classic and they're timeless. There's nothing odd about somebody of my age wearing a Fred Perry, for heaven's sake. Um, and because of that uh, forum, uh, people began to invite me to um, to places and, and sort me out and, and talk to me. Uh, um, there's uh, a regular, um, or at least once a year, uh, a reggae night in Dundee, which before COVID I used to go along to. Um, and found that I was a kind of an eminence grise there because I, I was, you know, I was from uh, the original era, um, and they liked to see me there, and they liked to see me um, wearing such clothes as I felt comfortable in, um, and it's. <sighs> I ended up, um, I ended up participating in a, a, a BBC documentary. Um, was that the Don Letts? Uh, that's the Don Letts thing. Yeah, I, I saw you on that. Yeah, it, it, it's kind of uh, six or one half a dozen the other. I'm okay with being known um, for my con um, connection to that era. Plus, it, it's kind of been a, a, a bit of a juggernaut. Uh, you know, once I get involved in one thing, somebody wants me to get involved in another. Um Somebody wants me to come along to the reggae night. You want me to appear on this, and it, you know, it, 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 it kind of goes on from there. So my, my involvement is, um, uh, <laughs> I have to say, I, I gave an in interview once in 1969 with an, um, a newspaper, um, and when they printed it, they printed it under the headline, "quote King of the Skinheads." I thought, oh my god, no. Oh, <laughs> because that was the last thing I wanted um, uh, uh, to um, uh, to put across, because I wasn't. I've oh. even seen people kind of um, mistake you for being the Steve Thompson character from the the Man Alive documentary. Uh, you know, it's obviously I wasn't in that, I wasn't in that one. No. Yeah. yeah. Um, you never but, met any of those kids, did you? What? No, no, wow. I didn't. Um, I, I, but just to go on from that, the one thing you um, used to get slapped down for was, um, uh, to use the phrase, I'm coming it, which meant um, adopting a damn sight more swagger, being a bit of a big head. And I thought, when they printed that thing saying King of the Skinners, I thought, that's bloody torn it. I won't be able to show my face anywhere. <laughs> um, and I remember being with a bun bunch of guys shortly after that, um, and I could see they were not impressed. So yeah, so I, I had to say, "Look, oh, bloody hell, no! Oh Christ, I wish they hadn't done that." Uh, and because I was, um, I wasn't <laughs> coming it uh, because I was taking the piss out of myself. They, 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 uh, they calmed down as well. Uh, when they realised that that the the, uh, the newspaper had just gone off on one, 
Wow, that's funny, man. I yeah. <laughs> so it's just kind of like a, a like a, a snowball effect, really. Of yeah, yeah. and uh, that, if you if you like the same kind of snowball effect, is uh, is happening now, um, and. You know, there'll be somebody out there. I always think if I ever do anything public, there'll be somebody out there thinking, hang on a minute, that's the bastard that did such and such. Uh, and yes, it's true. I am that bastard. Yeah, I I've, I mean, you know, I've some of the guys that I met, um, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago who were, original uh mods or skinheads or or they were um people like because i'm from boston so or i'm from massachusetts but mm -hmm. outside the boston area and uh we would there was some old timers out there that were uh either rats or collegiates there mm -hmm. was that was basically the mods and rockers of boston right and um boston massachusetts they had the rats and the collegiates mm -hmm. the rats were kind of like teddy boys yeah like a mix between a rocker and a teddy boy uh -huh. but they would wear they also might wear some kind kind of collegiate kind of clothing but with a more italian swagger right and um and the collegiates obviously you can you know they were mm -hmm. your Ivy League um, style, right? And yeah. they would have rumbles and stuff. And I would hear the, these guys talk about, um, you know, I, I met more of the the, the rats because they were more working class and the collegiate kids probably were all like, you know, had gone to college and made a bunch of money. But um, I would have loved, you know, if I had a smartphone back then, <laughs> To interview some this to get some of the the stories from these guys about the clothes, the music, and the fights, and ever like it was just it was you know amazing to hear about it you know especially for me as a teenager being in all that stuff. So, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm thank I, I'm I'm so grateful you came on here and you talked about all this stuff and you know uh, you know it's great to s still get the perspective that, you know, the media mm -hmm. is focusing um, obviously on the negative stuff that really will make the headlines. And that's what it seems to be. That's it's, what the media does. Yeah. I mean, you know. Uh, uh, They're not so, going to focus so on, uh, on, you know, Paul Thompson, you know, uh, <laughs> and until, until now, until yeah. now when you can like, yeah, when there's that that alternative media to that wants to set the record straight, so that's cool. Um, but uh, yeah, mainstream media thrives on bad news. Let's face it. You you know what's funny is like I there's this other um, news documentary thing that came out in 1970 about I think it was it was French. It was a uh, they it was like only one section of it they were interviewing. Uh, uh skinheads i think it was like a french documentary about you know english life or something right and they interview this group of skinheads and um it almost seemed like uh they were they had coached them mm -hmm. to say certain things yeah um it's also the fact that uh, a lot of um lads of my generation will tell you that, that that sometimes we played up to the media uh we took we took the mickey we told them any any old rubbish well Which yeah because you, you, so the this group of kids and there was a black skinhead in this uh -huh. group and they like were like you know why why do you why don't you like um you know pakistanis or whatever and some of these kids are like snicker and be like oh because they they smell like curry or something and um and then like one of them looked kind of almost he looked down he looked like ashamed like he what he had just said and i'm like i'm wondering if they actually like got these kids to say this stuff you know like coaxed them into it and then they asked the black kid 
you know what like who do, do you beat anyone up do you fight anyone he's like no i i, I wouldn't he's like well, I, you know, I fight, I'll, I'll fight like greasers or rockers or whatever. And then the, the French news reporter, he translates it and he says, oh, this kid like, likes to f beat up at Italians. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. Because, you know, like, it was because of the, um, uh, it was because of the, uh, the word greaser. Yeah. Which, which can mean all sorts of, I mean. Right, right. If you don't mind me using this term, um, if you say the S in that with a more of a Z sound, you say greaser. Uh, in parts of America, that refers to Mexicans. Oh, I didn't even know that. Um, and in other contexts, it refers to, it, it can refer to Italians. Um, so that's where they got that from. I mean, um, the terms greaser and skinhead, I found later, were imported from the, uh, from the USA. Um, yeah, uh, skinhead. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, so there's this, uh, gentleman I correspond with occasionally who I guess digs into newspaper archives mm -hmm. and, you know, he uses keywords or whatever. And yeah, there's these, uh, articles from America from 19, I guess it's like 1964 or 65. Yeah. Yep. where they're calling young these like young kids skinheads and they say mm -hmm. yeah they sh they have short hair and they they wear work you know work like work shoes or whatever and um and i you know it is sort of a a, a collegiate style or ivy league style or whatever i'm like this is so wild i yes yeah. not at I all think this is this is where I think, um, like I said, in about 1968, if somebody called you a skinhead, that was an, an insult, and it was usually the bikers that, uh, that that used the word skinhead to the sort of the era of late mods, um, and uh, then the name stuck. I mean, sometimes sometimes insults do uh, do stick. The the big one that I remember uh, from the 17th century, the Quakers. Now, originally Quaker was an was was an insult. Okay. And but the Society of Friends stuck with the name. They just just took it up. That's what they called it, Society of Friends. Yeah. Interesting. It's I'm gonna I can dig into see this is this is like this is the thing, and this is um this is why I just feel like I, I have a hard time like trusting like all the 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 history books, you know, mm -hmm. or just what you what they teach people at school or whatever it's like I, I how could they know exactly what was going on yeah. well um, nowadays go and they can't so, figure out what happened 10 years ago yeah. you know yeah uh, not boasting nowadays i'm a research student and if there's one thing i find it's uh that there are a heck of a lot of assumptions made about um cultures of only a few decades back uh that that's once you begin to look at them, are very very shaky, uh, and I think, what else have we got wrong? I mean, particularly, uh, I'm um, I, I'm looking at the 1950s and 1960s in the in the, in the work that I do at uni now, um, and I'm thinking so, such a lot of the assumptions that are made in critical writing, and we are really getting off topic now. Um, are, are, are based on uh, very, very quick, very, very easy uh, stereotypes. Uh, and these these snowball. And bringing it back on top, topic, it, it, I, I think to myself, if, if, if people are doing that in the area that I'm studying, they're doing it in all sorts of areas. And so no wonder they get the skinheads um, so um, arse about face. No, it's, it's, it's prevalent in every, I'm sure, in every subject. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I do have to uh, go very soon, but I, I wanted you to talk a little bit more. I, I, I want to find well, I actually want to find out more about, um, you know, what you're what you're studying and, and, mm -hmm. and what do, if, if you're fine. Are you going for a degree right now? Do you have a degree or um... well, <laughs> I've got I've gone off the edge of the world since since I retired. Um, I, I've got a bachelor's degree, a master's degree. And I'm studying for a doctorate, so. Uh, wow. you know. And you did that like like later in in your yeah. life. What, yeah. When did you when did you start pursuing that? Um, the age of sixty when I retired. 
All right. Well, you're giving me a lot of hope because uh, I'm I'm a late bloomer when it comes to ap- academics as well. So yeah. that um, you know, when I was a kid, I wasn't fit to shovel shit from one place to another. I really wasn't. Uh, I, I can relate, man. I can mm-hmm. definitely relate. Uh, I yeah, I, it it's it feels good to to hear. It. I mean, I'm sorry that that was like that, but it feels good to hear you say that because it, it, it um, I know I'm. I'm, I'm not alone in that. Uh, but yeah, I want you to just uh, talk about the book uh, really uh, quickly. I have about five minutes. Okay, Doug. Yeah, um, I, we talked about it briefly, but yeah, just maybe go into a little more detail and mm-hmm. what's it what's it about? When, when do you expect it to come out? <laughs> Don't put me on the spot like that. All right. <laughs> Because every time I think I must work on the book, some something else, uh, you, you know, you're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel um, and uh, you think it's the light at the end of the tunnel, but it's some bastard with a torch bringing more work. Um, and, and my life is like that at the moment. Uh, who knows? I might get something done on it this summer. But then again, it might be next summer, uh, the way things are going. As I say, I'm... I'm I'm having to uh, to self publish, and that isn't as easy as it sounds. What's what's the premise of the book? The, really, it's um, it's a digest of some of the things from the forum we were talking about. Uh, it's 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 rejigging them to, uh, to to sound more like a conversation. Um, we've got some very very interesting reminiscences um, from people who were who were there um, in the beginning and. Um, uh, again, I don't think it'll tell the full story, but it'll tell a few interesting uh, and interesting wrinkles and interesting um, uh, views on on what was going on. Okay, so but it's going to have a lot of, of photography, right? Uh, less than I would hope, because uh, because of copyright um, issues. Really? Um, yeah, it's it's very very difficult to find. Um, uh, photographs from the era that either you can find out who the owner is or um, that uh, um, uh, you you're, able, you're able to get permission to use. So that if you use some random, uh, okay, like Trojan, uh, or I was going to say uh, John Chidlow, who I just interviewed uh, mm-hmm. the other day, he has his Instagram page, Trojan Skin. 1970 or trojan skin 70 or so um he has one of the most amazing collections mm-hmm. of vintage uh skinhead photographs i've ever seen like I- i'm surprised a lot more of those aren't making it into that forum uh mm. I would, if i were you i'd totally go through his whole page and and talk to him uh, I, I I should have asked him more in that interview about where if, he. Uh, if I got the chance, I I would do, and I, I wish I'd had the chance earlier because there's, there's a um, lot of photos that we have not seen in that. It would, it, you know, going through this process would probably hold the book up even longer. Um, uh, it it actually briefly briefly came out, um, and instantly somebody was up in arms because uh, I'd used um, a, a couple of photographs which I didn't realize uh, had been taken by him, uh, were his copyrights and were already appearing in a book. And we had to pull the book. We had to pull the book instantly. Oh, my Um, goodness. And uh, since then, that that was one of the reasons why the publisher pulled out. Um, They're they're still kind of helping me, um, kind of a pro bono approach, but they they won't... um, that they, they won't take the risk of having it under their. Uh, you just don't know if some, you know, someone sees it one day. It says can somehow prove that they took that photograph, and then yeah, then it could be a mess, right? So it, it could be, but the, the ones that we're left with are, are either ones we really, really can't um, uh, source. That we really can't find anybody to to claim them. Uh, some of uh, I, I try to keep my own face out as much as possible, but I've got some photographs of myself in there. Um, some of which were taken by um, uh, a guy um, who um, was at college with me, uh, and he's okay with that. Uh, well, we, I'm, we, they're they're 
they're classics you know like <laughs> they're they're basically you can google you can google your name and um you know there's some some of the your standards uh you know the classic I found, I found a picture of myself um i found a picture of myself used i think using the poster from brazil that was really bizarre um but uh We've got a picture from, exa for example, from International Times, the the the, the hippie newspaper. Now, we can use that because they didn't believe in copyright. It was one of their principles. Um, I was I was in touch with uh, a guy I knew from uh, that newspaper, and, and he said, um, "Just use it." What's the, what's the? Do you have a name for the book yet? It's called Walk Proud. Walk Proud, and why did you choose that name? Um, it was a group choice. Uh, from the forum? Yeah. Gotcha. All right, yeah. I mean, uh, I have I have to run, but um, thank you so much for coming on. Um, also, I'm going to send you a link to, I, um, you know, I produce these shirts and stuff. If you ever, mm -hmm. if you see anything you like, I'd like to gift you one. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, Bye. thanks so much. By the way, Nick, it's, this has been great. I'll ask you two questions. One I should have asked, uh, asked well, I think both I should have asked at the beginning. Is this being recorded? And who's watching it live? Uh, we didn't get many, many people watching it. Only a few popped in. Oh. But, yeah, it, it is recorded. It's going to be on my YouTube channel, uh, right. Vegan Equilibrium. And um, uh, if you want, I can send you a copy. Oh, that would that'd be great. That'd be great. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's on YouTube. Yeah. But some people will say, isn't that the bastard who did such and such? <laughs> and I said, yes, I, I hold my hands up to that entirely. Yeah. Um, I, 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 you know, who's, who's led a blameless life? I, I know no, I have. No. That, certainly Never mind not. the skinhead era. Never mind the skinhead era throughout my life. Who, you know, um, I, 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 I'm only lately one of the good guys, I think. I, I I hope to maybe get to that status at some point, but I hope so too. Long road, right? Heaven somehow, Nick. All right, thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Paul. Uh, You're very a, welcome. Have a great day. We'll talk and soon. You. It's been a great pleasure. Cheers. Cheers, mate.